Hey. No. <laughs> Hi, how's it going, Joyce? You okay? Good, good. No, I thought I was going in panic. I thought, oh no, am I going to you know run Zoom or double check my time? Oh, I'm- I'm so sorry. I, I got caught up with a with a student um, and I, I had to um, make sure that he got hold of a letter as an emergency because yeah, yeah. he's going to be conscripted um, to you to an army. Um, so <laughs> so I had to get uh, this letter sorted out uh, because he, he was um, uh, he was going to the embassy tomorrow morning um, mm. and then that delayed me. I'm so sorry. No, um, it shouldn't be. This is what a true professional teacher is like. <laughs> Yeah. You always have to put your student first, you know, because yeah, yeah, and I remember how many times that you kind of put your lunch down and mm. say, "There's a student out there who needs yeah. help." <laughs> so. I know, and and the amount of days that I even forget to even have lunch, like you wouldn't believe it. Looking at the size of me, you know, like I'm I'm quite a chubby fellow, but um, but yeah, so, some days I I completely forget because we get. We get bombarded, don't we, left and right by um, colleagues and, and students with um, very small tasks that take, a, you know, a small amount of time to complete, but they all add up. And before you know it, your day is completely gone. Yeah, I know. But I, I think I always say to people from my own experience, too, when you have to eat, you have to eat. You yeah. know, it's very important to look after <laughs> ourselves <laughs> yeah. you know i i've been i don't know how many times i tell people this last year i said you've got to look after yourself because the only way to look after more people yeah around yeah. you is to first look after number one you know yeah that that's right that's <laughs> um that's a good foundation of well-being isn't it um, yeah. where some people can become um concerned with the worries of those around them and neglect yeah. themselves and yeah. I always try to remember um, the sort of the metaphor analogy of, um, you know, if you're on a plane and the plane is uh, going down or having a warning, um, you're always asked to put your own mask on first and then the mask of everybody else around you and the children yeah. and stuff. So that's the same sort of thing. If you bear that in mind that, yeah. you know, you can only help other people when you're up to it as well definitely that's a really good example actually you know mm. and but how often as you know being a teacher being an educator how often that we just kind of always think for other people's and I think that's why we are in this profession because yeah we always put other people first and then you forget about your own needs and and your own yeah, kind that's, of well-being that, that's true <laughs> I mean and that's um you can see that very plainly with um you know, if you think of uh, a mad scientist, just get that image in your head right now. It's, um, who is it? It's somebody with, uh, you know, white hair, like out here, uncut, you know, he's in his lab all the time. All you have to do is go to any university in the UK, probably around the world, and you will see guys like that everywhere because they're so focused on the work um, or on helping other people. <clears throat> they completely forget about the the body that they're walking around in <laughs> i'm sure they're glad glad to hear that <laughs> yeah. that, <clears throat> that was like me uh, a couple of months ago you know with the beard coming down here and you know eventually over christmas i had time and i looked in the mirror and i thought what what am i doing like you know when you have that time to reflect i was like i need to sort this out I, I look like a homeless, but well, no, no disrespect to homeless people, but I looked homeless. Like I looked like Gri- Grizzly Adams. Um, do you know who Grizzly Adams is? Mm, I think I probably know because I haven't watched Homer Simpson for a while. But yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gr- Grizzly Adams was like a, a TV show in the seventies. It's based on a book, and it's about this guy who goes out into the wilderness um, in America. He's had enough of society. Um, mm. The people are like persecuting him there. And um, he goes out there and he, he saves a baby bear um, from falling off a cliff. And then he befriends that bear. And it's all about their adventures together in the wilderness. It's good. Oh, well, I have, yeah. to, I have to Google it now. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, <clears throat> we're not here to talk about Grizzly Adams or me being late or anything like that. We're here to talk about you. Um, and I just want to say, you look amazing. Your hair has grown like really long since last time I, I saw know. you. I know. Well, just talking about having your, your beard trimmed, you know, yeah. I've been I've been letting it go because I really yeah. should 
have a haircut actually i'm going to look for a haircut this wednesday oh no but it looks yeah. so nice like oh you know, look, nice thank and long. you yeah <laughs> but my my hairdresser is so busy you know it's like every yeah. time i phone her she's like i'm sorry i haven't got a slot and so you know this is actually sec second time round now last year wow. during lockdown my hair was longer than this yeah and then i had a cut in the summer and then it's so they all grow back anyway it's, it's come back yeah, again thank you <laughs> nice so um so we kind of we message each, each other back and forth a little bit and we came up with a you know a few questions so yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna start at the top and um you know i'm interested in finding out more about you know your background um so where did you grow up and did that affect who you became or who you are now well <clears throat> It's a very interesting question, you know, because I've been living here in England, more specifically, yeah. for about 20 years now. So I often think about this because I probably will be living here, mm. you know, more than my time growing up in Taiwan. So I'm mm. from Taiwan and I was okay. born in the capital city of Taipei. Um, it's an amazing city. I'm sure you you love to go and visit because it's a bit like Tokyo. You know, it's so busy. Everything 24 hours and everything modern. It's very fast moving. You know, so I yeah. actually I was growing up in a very fast paced city life. So I I was a city girl, but now I'm converted into a country girl. Yeah. Ish. <laughs> Ish. <clears throat> so yeah, it's. It's just hard to imagine, you know, because I would be, you know, everything was surrounded by modern buildings, you know, all the technology, you know, you got Wi-Fi everywhere, super fast Wi-Fi, rather than trying to fight for, <laughs> for the signal with my husband, you know, both working at home. So it's really hard to imagine that. And to be honest, the last few years, I keep having this kind of conflicting thoughts between I suppose different kind of roles and different identities because I was I was born and grew up in a very different culture you know um it was very modern cosmopolitan everything was fast 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 and also the kind of society um quite often gives you a lot of pressure you know that kind of you, you have to keep up to date with everything yeah you have to be perfect you know so whatever you do you have to do your 101 percent you know not 100 percent it's got to be 101 percent but the last few years you know because of covid you know the whole situation i think a lot of people probably you can hear a lot of people sharing you know how much covid has changed their life you know people reevaluate their life and so on and for me, this is actually an ongoing journey because living in the UK, you know, basically I immerse myself. I love the British culture. I love everything, you know, here. But there's a part of me, I know that deep down, you know, I was growing up in Taiwan, you know, this modern city and a lot of values, you know, that I was influenced from my family or the society they remain with me, you know, particularly mm. I was growing up in a very big family, you know, there are about 25 people and my grandmother, you know, I often tell my peop people about my grandmother, she's amazing, you know, she's, she dedicated herself to the whole family, she cooked three meals a day for 25 people, she always tried to accommodate everybody's needs. You know, when you talk about the greatest influence, that was my grandmother. She was amazing. Mm. So th those 25 people, would that be um, <clears throat> like siblings and cousins living together? Yeah, uncles, aunties, you know, we all live in the same building. Obviously, they're all like apartments, you know, flats. But we all live kind of in the same building. So, you know, upstairs, you've got uncles, aunties, cousins, and then my grandparents next door you know, and lots of kids. So we kind of live in a, in a community, you know, we, yeah. we look out for each other, you know, no matter what, you know, there's always somebody, you know, in this building, including neighbors, you know, we all know each other very well. That's, <laughs> that's like, um, that's something that's really, really nice. And something that I've noticed that is 
um, perhaps missing from English culture um, as much because um, <clears throat> similar to you, I'm not, I'm not originally from here. I was born in Ireland in Dublin and I grew up there um, till I was about six or seven. So again, city boy, you know, like used to the crowds and the cities. And then I, I went from there to County Mayo, which is in the west of Ireland. Like, so I went from the city to the country and then, I, and then um, my accent changed uh, to like a country accent. And then um, I very briefly went back to, to Dublin before coming to England. Um, <clears throat> but the, the countryside um, had a huge impact on me. Um, and I've always, um, I've always loved it ever since. And I, you know, I kind of, I feel like, um, I feel like um, a citizen of, of both places. Like I hold like all of the lessons from childhood really dear to me. Um, and the, the one person from my family who um, I have the fondest memories of would be my granddad. So similar to you, you know, he taught me how to how to like interact with people when you greet people how to be nice and he was a very upbeat very friendly guy he seemed to know everybody in the village he taught me about growing vegetables um you know and stuff like that so yeah s similar sort of thing to you with you with your grandma so um yeah t tell me more about your grandma and about um the kind of things that that she would do because that's a lot of work looking after 25 people oh yeah yeah i mean to be honest she she actually grew up in a well um respected family you know actually back in those days there were not many girls who actually had education you know so if you think about uh, culturally again you know women were not expected to actually even go to schools but my grandmother actually went to school and she progressed to actually a secondary school she attended a, a girls um, all girls um, high school actually and she was like a class leader like a head girl mm. so she was, like, like a prefect yeah 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 and she was amazing because she often talked about her her school days you know she was very bright and she had a lot of dreams she wanted to pursue and there was a very nice story which she talked about it a lot and I think she felt to some extent she always felt regretted you know because she wanted to be a doctor, actually, but again, back in those days, you know, being a girl, you, you're you not expected yeah. to have a career, you would get married, you know, that's it, you know, you look after family and so on. And her best friend and her actually plan to get a boat to get across to Japan, you know, they wanted okay. to leave Taiwan and wanted to go to Japan to study in a medical school, but this is when I think my grandmother's story had a turn because she decided against it, you know, yeah. she spoke to her, her older brother and her older brother almost talked her out of it. So she didn't go. And mm. all her life, she talked about this story. But what is amazing is in our family, she treat, treats every grandchildren the same. Doesn't matter you are boy or girl, particularly, you know, in the society where you know, the inequality between boys and girls in those days. You know, my grandmother said, I don't care if you are boys, girls, I want every single child in my family has education. Yeah. So she was supported, you know, despite she, she didn't work, but she would save up her, you know, money from buying vegetables, you know, go to the market, a little bit of, you know, money to save up and just to support, you know, her children, her grandchildren to, to buy books, to go to schools. So she was amazing. And she said, this whole house, the whole family, you only need one cook, that will be me. So that's my yeah. grandmother. She will look after the house. She, she was a homemaker. She looked after the house, but everybody else, you know, you go and pursue, you get your education, you pursue your dreams. And that is amazing. That is yeah. such a sacrifice. She she's almost like um she she's almost like a saint for your family, you know? Like she made that that choice and that sacrifice that um that the next generation would be better off, that the next generation or the next two generations would have more opportunities than she was allowed to have. Yeah, definitely. And I think today, obviously, unfortunately, she passed away about four years ago. And that kind of coincided when my, my son was born. Mm. 
Yeah. So I was really grateful. I did manage to bring my boy to Taiwan and met with my grandmother, you know, and my boys met, you know, his great grandmother. And that was so precious. And I had the photographs and I really cherish it because, you know, I, I was quite late to have a child because all my cousins, they all started their family quite early on. Yeah. And my son <laughs> is like the youngest, if you put it that way, the youngest out, out of, of all the family. Yeah. yeah. So that was amazing, you know, and, and I still feel she's around me sometimes, you know, she's like a guardian angel sometimes, you know, I know some people may not believe in that, but I always feel when I'm feeling down, when I, when I have challenges, you know, I think of her, I think, think about her, you know, her. Yeah. I, ha <laughs> I have um I have the same sort of feeling that um you know if if I have a choice or you know if if I'm gonna do something naughty like you know you know or maybe there's a potential to misbehave I kind of I have this niggling this little thought and I think you know what would your granddad think about that you know it helps to keep me on the on the right path wow. um you know and and I just I think um not having not having the best um uh p paternal uh role model <clears throat> um growing up that um i would always uh look to other role models like um whether they be fictional or real so like actors like arnold schwarzenegger were really important to me growing up you know good masculine uh, <laughs> uh role model and um you know so schwarzenegger superman spider-man and then you know my grandfather or anybody else who was you know uh, a nice sort of male role model um and i kind of carry that with me um you know even now so um you know there, there, there's like there's good and bad aspects to everybody but yeah that that thought that feeling of um you know that the they're, they're kind of still here in a way like yeah i get that because i i do feel that a lot um i do talk to my wife about that as well that um you know i feel lucky i feel like i am being looked out for or you know maybe not in um in a way where there's like you know a ghost or a spirit or something coming but maybe somebody's put in a good word for me you know somewhere else you know that mm -hmm. kind of thing yeah. yeah it's nice you know it's nice to have something kind of i suppose obviously in different contexts but you know it, it's nice to have that connection you know i immediately feel connected you know you talk about your granddad you know i almost feel like i can see you know like you could almost imagine this person yeah. I, have, um, I have a picture of him here actually oh right. wow i'm gonna hold it up uh, oh. maybe so, oh i can just see him oh wow yeah I, mean, I think in my i think my grandma is down here it's kind of uh can't really see it. No, it's not no, going to show you. Sort of... I'll have to show you next time. But yeah, you saw my granddad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they they were um they were very productive, and um I think my I think my mummy is like the youngest of seven or eight or something like that. So that that was a, a pretty big family um growing up as well. Mm -hmm. So are you um family is super important to you then? Um, you know, right now, are you, are you still in touch? Like how, how difficult is it to get back to Taiwan? Where, where are all of your connections? Are they still there or have they spread out across the group, uh, the globe? Well, um, actually, interestingly, um, most of my family, close family members are all in Taiwan, you know, and I, I would say, apart from me my sister as well my sister actually stayed in japan for about 10 years okay so in our family i would say my sister and i are the how do you describe it? black sheep <laughs> in the family <laughs> well actually my dad because my dad used to travel around the world you know most of the time he wasn't home you know i don't want to portray him as the missing <laughs> dad but yeah. It was, you know, half the year he will be somewhere else. He's been to more than 50 countries. Cause so so um, was that because of his job or was he a spy or like what's the crack? Well, now? I think a bit of various reasons. You yeah. know, I think, yeah. I think he loved traveling and mm. sort of in conjunction with his work, he was, he was like a, you know, a salesman, you know, he would go traveling and back in those days, you know, you get invited anyway to visit their companies yeah. and so on. So she would jump to the opportunity to do that. And plus, I think because in our family, you know, my mom, my sister and me, there are three women in the household. 
<laughs> yeah. Pardon me, I feel like that was his excuse <laughs> just to get out of the house sometimes. Yeah, that, that's um, that's similar to my setup right now where, you know, I'm completely outnumbered. <laughs> I think my dad must my dad is such a patient person you know I think he was so quiet because when you have a family full of women actually our family tend to have more women than men so you often see the men are super quiet you know they, they're quite reserved and you got all these women <laughs> chatting away and I think now looking back I can totally I can totally understand why my dad chose to travel <laughs> <laughs> just to get a break just have a bit of a holiday <laughs> like he loves you but um you know he needs that little time alone yes um, yeah definitely definitely otherwise there's no escape you know it's yeah, really hard yeah. and then I think personally um my sister and I probably have a bit of my dad you know because my dad rarely talk about his business trips yeah. but I think now I'm older, you know, I often ask him a little bit more questions. You know, he had a photograph, you know, he must have lots and lots of stories. And it's yeah. really strange when I was younger, you know, I, I suppose for me, you know, I focused more on myself, you know, creating my own experience. So I didn't really mm. pay attention to, you know, my dad or, or my family, you know, what they used to do. But yeah. now getting a bit older and have my own child, you know, suddenly I feel when you talk, talk about family, I'm very close to my families, but at the same time, I feel I don't know them enough. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> and yeah. family history has become something that I, I feel like I, I want to learn more about, you know, from my husband's size of families and my family size as well. And I keep contact with them all the time. And luckily we have technology these days, you know. Yeah, it definitely makes it easier because um, yeah. I have a lot of family in Ireland. My mum lives there, um, older sister, uh, all uncles and cousins and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's just me and my wife down here uh, in Norfolk with our kids. And um, yeah, so we've got friends and uh, family everywhere. So if it wasn't for um, technology, WhatsApp, Facebook, you know, Zoom and, and the like, um, we'd really struggle to um, maintain those relationships. I don't know how people used to do it a long time ago. I think maybe that's why people didn't move around that much. Yeah, it, there was a barrier, you know, you couldn't see each other. Or I still remember it, I had to buy a phone card, you know, from the shop mm. and they had to scratch the number. Yeah, yeah. And then you and, got a connector to say, I'm phoning Taiwan and then you get connected. <laughs> So, yeah, it, it was like that. I went to, um, I lived in Ireland for a bit in my early 20s. So I went back over there, uh, 2002 uh, to three, something like that, or 2004. And um, yeah, there, there was like internet cafe, cafes everywhere. They were awesome. Like you could go there, use the internet, pay per minute or whatever it was. But they were also, they were international call centers. So same thing. Uh, you go in, they give you a prepayment card. They had all the different booths. People would be going in there and great, great place to meet um, foreign people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. So I think, I think there's something about technology, you know, I think particularly with COVID as well, there's quite a lot of debates in there about, you know, the, the role technology plays, you know, and I feel actually technology helps in many ways you know to look at the benefits particularly you know like in your case in my case without technology you know I wouldn't be able to keep contact with my family and knowing what they are doing sending photographs you know and also you know get connected you know because yeah. like you you know be leaving Norfolk you know and so far away from my family and mm. hus my husband's family as well down in London you know I think is so so important to stay connected and and sharing you know life as well although we can't see each other very often yeah. but at least we have the technology to do it as well yeah that's um yeah that's a big part of it sharing videos of the of the kids running around and and yeah. sharing um, photographs of them growing up even though yeah. you can't be there because of covid then you know you can still they can still sort of take part and see them grow in a way yeah. Yeah. So um, you, you spoke a bit about your dad and you said, um, you know, he, he was a quiet man. So would you would you class him as an introvert or an extrovert? Oh, yeah. Well, I think 
it's an interesting question, you know, because I think I reckon my dad and I are very similar in many ways. Yeah. And I have come across a term. I think we are, my dad and I are both extroverted introvert. Mm. <laughs> so we are, or some people call call this type of people outgoing introverts. Yeah. Does that make any sense? So basically, yeah, it does. Yeah, we are so... actually very quiet. You know, we we love yeah. our space. You know, I love my space actually. You know, and it it actually has taken me a long time to recognize it because when I was a child, I was actually really quiet, really shy, and you wouldn't even imagine that I would be a teacher. You know, <laughs> never <Yeah>. ever. <laughs> I was so quiet, and then. I think must be when I was around teenage years, you know, my confidence started growing and I realized that I, I do like people. I do like to be with people and you know, I like meeting new people. I'm yeah. excited about meeting different people, but at the same time, I also recognize that I need my own space. You know, I, I like my quiet moment. I think my dad is exactly the same, you know, cause he's out traveling all the time. I mean, yeah the number of people he's met you know in different languages you know spanish whatever languages you can imagine he must be quite quite uh, good at you know his social skills because he has to meet all these new people but at the same time he's always very quiet at home you know he, he's, he likes reading his papers he loves his music you know he introduced me to western music like the beatles you know all the sort of english songs put it that way you know, and that's how I loved, I actually enjoy learning English. You know, I love learning English language when I was younger. And you, you picked that up through the songs. Um, a, a lot of people do that they, through, through songs or sitcoms and, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and I often find that um, foreign friends that, that I have, um, a lot of the TV and the songs are American. So they'll pick up like an American accent, mm. um, even though they've never been there. And they think, oh, you know, this is... This is English, but they're like speaking American English. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know what you mean about being like an extroverted introvert where um, like at the end of, you know, when I'm in college and I'm teaching all day, you're up basically on a stage and you have to be mindful of, you know, everything that you say. And um, you, you're also looking after the needs of loads of different individuals and trying to balance loads of different tasks. Um, and, you know, it, it helps when you're outgoing and confident. But then at the end of the day, I, I need to go and retreat <laughs> somewhere and, and sort of regain that energy and just lie down like, you know, in a quiet room, even just five, 10 minutes is kind of, you know, that, that's good enough just to kind of center myself again and then get back to it. And it, it's the same with um, even with hanging out with friends, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if I noticed that I was always this way. But um, yeah, you know, a couple of hours is good enough for me or, you know, a day, you know, if you're staying over together somewhere, we need that time to, to go, go back, recharge, refresh, and then come back again uh, with like renewed enthusiasm. Is that kind of how you feel? Definitely. And also, I don't know if you are into uh, astrology or, you know, like star <laughs> signs. I was born in July. You know, I used to be when I was younger. I love everything about star signs, tarots, you know, tarots yeah. cards, you know, Chinese, you know, um, animal signs and everything. And because I was born in July, you know, so I was, I'm a cancer. So again, yeah. if you read into it, you know, if you, I don't want to generalize it, but if you were like born in July, you tend to be quite a homey person. So, you know, a cancer. So it's like, you like the crap you yeah sometimes you have to kind of retrieve into your little little <laughs> cave <laughs> and then you'll come out again so I love that and I think it's so suited to my personality you know because I can be out I can be confidently doing what I, I need to do but actually I also need my little time you know my woman my women cave or whatever. yeah yeah, your my, cave, yeah this is my study so this yeah. is my little cave and away from anyone not even my husband or my child. I just need that kind of time, you know, to myself, you know, just to process everything. And you're right. People tend to underestimate the emotional work 
involved in education, you know, not yeah. only just being a teacher, any jobs involved with people, you know, yeah. I think people totally underestimate it, you know, and sometimes we don't have time to process all the emotional work, you know, we put into, and that is something that I personally feel quite passionate about, you know, in terms of teachers' well-being. And actually, funny enough, that came out of my doctorate thesis, you know, the, the sort of emotional mm. connection and the emotional work, you know, we are doing on a daily basis. Yeah, it's um it's kind of um it's kind of like a, a, a tricky thing to balance, isn't it? Because you're there to do a very specific job, which is um to uh, give the students goals to aim towards and then to monitor their progress and to make sure that they achieve but every single student comes with like a unique backstory and a unique life that they're currently going through and they all have um, their own challenges and difficulties um, you know and they might be um, financial or well-being or no stability or um, uh, learning difficulty or you know it doesn't doesn't matter what it is that you, you have to account for that um in the classroom and when you spend like a whole year or even if they went through the whole um sort of curriculum with you from level one to undergraduate if they spent like six years with you and you're there looking after them you you, you would develop that that sort of bond where you you know it's that they are almost like a family you know i feel very protective of of my students um and, and want to make sure that that they do that they do the best that they can do um but yeah it can be especially if if somebody that you you care about as a student has just been hit with something that is like you know like a tragedy or something you kind of you feel that um you know you have to kind of um cut yourself off from that um without feeling too guilty about it as well you're not allowed to really get too emotionally invested i think yeah i think there's something that probably it is something important particularly now you know more than ever you know because of covid i think kind of brought a lot of those issues up you know family home issues and you're right you know the amount of time they spend with us you mm. know actually at the college in in schools or whatever you know you may find some students they probably spend more time with us than their own family yeah put it that way so I think, you know, we need to redefine, you know, sometimes we have to redefine our role. And I agree that there need to be some boundaries because, yeah. you know, like everything, if you don't have the boundary, sometimes it's all consuming. It's all very consuming. Mm. So it is about how to, to manage that boundary. But at the same time, you know, we are in a job actually being caring, you know, yeah. it's one of the, quality it is the characteristics we have that's why we come into it but at the same time is that kind of expectation you know how we support our students to okay achieve their qualification but actually there's a whole bag of it's like the the tip of the iceberg but there's all the rest of you know other you know life skills and issues or concerns that we also need to look after as well so it's not just about that qualification yes the qualification is so important mm. but my personal view is particularly nowadays you know we are not only just teach the qualification only you know as you know we, we got all the other things that we need to look after and sometimes we don't know everything you know I often say to my yeah. students you know I don't know everything you know sometimes it's kind of like the problems throw at you really you know and you think oh my goodness you know how do I deal with this you know I, I'm, I have no idea and like I had one student that's a long time ago this student was thrown out of her own home you know she got no way to stay yeah it so I was quite new as well <clears throat> so I was like what do I do <laughs> yeah you're like oh do, do you want to come and stay with me <laughs> like, you know, you well, exactly yeah. but then you can't you can't yeah. <laughs> So again, you know, those things um, that the books don't teach you, you yeah. know, um, and I dare say, you know, I'm also reflecting on, for example, teacher education as well, you know, what do we teach? You know, what, what should we teach? Yeah. Um, and I ask myself and qu question myself all the time, you know, because these kind of questions, they don't show up 
in PGC textbooks, do they? Yeah. You know, they don't show up <laughs> <laughs> in the toolkits. They don't show up. So how do you do about it? How do you go about it? So. I think maybe um, you have to use your own uh, your own best judgment at the time, um, or you know, seek advice from somebody else who's more experienced. And um, depending on the situation, then you have to go to um, you know follow the policy. And if it, you know if it's a safeguarding issue, or whatever. I think perhaps that's why they have that in place, where um, it kind of prevents you from becoming emotionally involved. But it's um, for me, it's always in the back of my mind that um, you know somebody is going through that difficulty, um, and you know. To, to try and um, make sure that they're okay and that college is a, a safe place for them. They feel comfortable. And in, in, in some, some ways that um, by, by following that ethos, um, it makes them more comfortable coming in. Like that's, you know, that is their, their safe place where they can be. And, you know, whatever chaos is going on in the background, at least they know that they've got a consistent team of uh, people to look after them there. And, yeah. and, and focus them take their mind off things for a few hours a day yeah yeah I think you you kind of also touch on what I was hoping to bring out is educators and teachers you know we we also need the support you know just talking it through and sharing this kind of I suppose concerns in a safe space you know and like you yeah. say you know I remember I was exactly the same because I was dealing with it I knew I had to deal with that situation but that in my mind I was constantly thinking of that student you yeah. know I was thinking I wonder how she was I, I hope she settled in I hope she'll you know whoever helping her will find some way for her to stay you know but we don't talk about those things because it's it's kind of subconsciously you know hanging you know yeah, but then yeah. the problem is because we tend to throw ourselves in the everyday teaching situation you know that's sort of push to the back of our mind yeah but we don't realize it's always there <laughs> yeah it's it's also the fact like that it's it's not that we don't care um you know i, I wouldn't i would hate for any student to think oh they're too they're too busy to you know think about me or whatever it's not that we don't care because we do and we do spend a lot of time thinking of um, students who need help it's just that we're very limited in what we can do um, and we're, we're also we get weighed down by all of the other priorities and tasks um, that, that come at us um, it's, a, it's a very fast-paced job and I, I don't I don't think uh, you know a lot of people or people in the public um, understand exactly what it is that is a teacher anymore like you know when when they went to school when you go to school as a student you have an impression of what it is this relationship that you have with uh, with the teacher and you see the teacher in the classroom they give you the work they tell you off if you haven't done it or if you're misbehaving and that's all you see but you don't see everything that goes on in the background like all of the preparation the collaboration um all of the decision making um you know all of the administration all of that stuff um and the you know the planning and pre preparation for success and and following things up it's it's a massive job that i think is completely misunderstood um and i, I think more teachers need to talk about what it is that they actually do and how they put their own lives on hold um for the job as well i think that's that's something that that needs to be shouted out about a bit more Totally, you know, I think that's why I feel like we all have a voice to, you know, we have to raise our voice. When we talk about raising our voice, it's about sharing our narratives, you know, our stories, you mm. know, what it's like. And you're right, because we are making lots of decisions, you know, every day. And sometimes this knowledge, you know, this sort of way of working is really hard to, you can't, it's very hard to actually um, capture them. You know, because when you say, okay, if I ask you, tell me about what being a teacher is like, there's just so much. There's just yeah, so many elements. Yeah. And I think sometimes you're right. I think people tend to underestimate, you know, the amount of skills, knowledge, you know, involved in being a teacher. It's not just about teaching a subject, you know, like teaching a language or, or teaching business studies, but there's more to that. You know, it's not yeah. only just about the subject. And particularly, I find that nowadays, you know, teaching young adults and adults, you know, I think 
we are living in a very different age now, and particularly with your background, your computing and technology, it is how what learning is like, you know, how can we learn and what mm-hmm. learning is like is so different from, you know, when I was growing up. Because when I was growing up, the fountain of knowledge was actually from the teacher. You know, teachers yeah. is the resource or you have to go to a library. I don't know, you know, yeah, you might be younger than me, but <laughs> yeah, go, go, to the, go to the library, find the textbook. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. that even, even when I was, um, you know, at, at college doing um, IT, um, you know, the, the textbook was where you got the knowledge from. It wasn't the internet. Like there might've been some stuff on the internet, but it was more um, encyclopedias that were uh, Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that. There might, yeah. might've been installed on there. So it wasn't like updated information. It was just a digital version of a book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you had to go to the specialists and, and they were the experts. And I think now that people can get any information at the touch of a button on their phone that is um that has brought about the end of the age of the expert mm-hmm. even though it's the experts who put the knowledge online yeah so i mean i found the last 10 years you know being because i started off as a primary school teacher um so my way of working was very traditional you know 20 years ago but the last 10, 20 years, I feel like be, even being a teacher myself, I have to really keep up to date, you know, because learning is different now. You know, we have internet, we have lots of platforms, we have lots of resources. You know, I think almost knowledge needs to be managed. You know, the mm. amount of knowledge we receive or information, I suppose, we receive is masses and masses. So I find that, you know, I almost have to relearn about, you know, I suppose the the next generation, you know, the next gen, you know, how they were growing up, you know, it's so different. I'm looking at my boy as well. I'm trying to kind of use my, actually my boy is also my resource, you know, I'm trying to kind of figure out. So how do they learn at school these days, you know? And So so would you say, is this, um, is this a big challenge for you in your life? I will say so, you know, because I, I think about this question in terms of challenge. I think I've been through lots of challenges, but I will say being a parent, becoming a parent is it, probably the biggest challenge, but it's also the greatest joy. Yeah. Um, I often share openly about it because um, sort of the last four years, you know, after having my boy, I went through a really difficult time. I had postnatal depression. Um, But I I was also campaigning about it, you know, because how often people almost brush it under the carpet to say, oh, yeah, that's normal. You know, having baby blue is normal. Yeah. And it certainly wasn't normal for me, you know, because I I thought I was able to carry on my life, you know, before Mm. I had my boy. But obviously, maybe I was a bit naive because, you know, being a parent is a big big life life changing it, 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 it is completely life changing <laughs> as, yeah. as i found out yeah yeah and then i guess also coming from i suppose if i come from a woman's perspective you know because i had a career yeah. you know i was very career driven i built my identity largely from work yeah you know, and plus coming from a different culture because i moved away from taiwan I had to rebuild literally from zero, ground zero with Mm. family, you know, experience, everything. So I think the moment I suddenly felt, I think that was a moment of feeling like, oh, I'm a mother now, you know, and doing maternity leave, you know, I think I was really struggling, you know, I'm not joking about it. I know lots of women tend to talk about how wonderful it is, but it wasn't nice for me. It wasn't not nice for me because I just struggled so much. And I think looking back, I realized there were lots of things, for example, um, that kind of sense of loss of identities, you know, trying to regain, you know, who I am. And also obviously lack of sleep. I'm sure yeah, a lot of people that, say that. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to ask you about the, uh, the lack of sleep, because, um, you know, that, that really affected um, my wife and, and me, like, you know, to, to some extent as well, although she has been phenomenal like through the whole thing because um 
she she really puts me first and makes sure that you know i'm able to get as much sleep as i can um undisturbed so that i'm she understands like you know that i have to be on the top of my game for that job um you know for being in front of the kids and, and all the stuff that goes with it so you know she really takes one for the team um regarding getting up in the night looking after the kids you know all the stuff that um is is in most cases i think shared um in, in a lot of situations um you know she she really takes care of that and it the, the first time around um with penelope it was is brand new and so it was um it was tricky for both of us and we we're both trying to manage it but now we've you know we've come up with a a, a good system um and it, it, in in some ways it's i don't know if it's easier or it feels easier now because we've got to um it, it kind of it just doesn't seem as hard or as stressful now uh with with the second one um even though she does wake up quite a lot yeah so so lack of sleep is something that that we manage a lot and that um when she's feeling particularly tired that's when i step in i'll take the kids out look after them she can go get a nap and you know do that sort of stuff so we're, we're looking out for each other we've got a, we've got a good system now but oh man i sympathize with parents <laughs> I know. And again, you know, I often say, you know, you can buy as many books about parenting, you know, but nobody would teach you, you know, from your real experience, you know, because every child is different. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. then, and then I, uh, you are right, though, it's going back to teamwork, you know, that kind of having the support in place, and you've got to work in partnerships yeah in many ways and that is not just about being parents it's about at work as well and i find going back to your very beginning of the, the conversation you know we these days we feel like we, we tend to have very small core families you know mm -hmm. it's not the whole village looking after each other anymore yeah. but i feel ever strongly that we have to bring that village back you know that kind of we are all here to help each other going through tough times share the joy rather than be competitive and this is this year i i realized that you know being competitive is really not for human beings you know it's not good for our mental health it's actually about lifting each other up you know and then that was a, a really good example i came across I can't remember who talked about it, but my husband is very into uh, sports psychology. You know, a lot of, you know, footballers, they wrote about their stories. It must be one of the, uh, the coaches or the manager to say, it's a bit like um, geese. You know, if you see the geese in the sky, particularly recently, if you look at the sky, you know, it's just amazing to see how they form the V shape. You know, they were flying, but apparently the way they were is, you know, one of the geese would lead, you know, everybody yeah. else. But if this leading goose is tired, you know, it would sort of fall back and somebody yeah. else will take the place. So it's about that shared leadership. It's about we are all leaders, but sometimes we all get tired. You know, we can get yeah. tired. But what we need is not about taking on more everything on our shoulders. It's about we, we share you know, these kind of responsibilities and we are helping each other out. So as a team, you know, we will then get to the destination we want to and we can look after each other, you know. So I think such a beautiful, you know, example about animals, you know, we, we learn from the animals, you know, how they do it. But what about us human beings? How can we almost feel like we're losing that kind of ability, that sense of communities. And I know it's quite easy to talk about communities, but building communities takes so much effort. So. Yeah, I, I, I think um, the, the infrastructure for those communities is not, is not as present as it once was. So if you think of like um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, you would have, um, you know, this has been drastically affected by um, the pandemic. You'd have like a, a pub that the community would go to, possibly, you know, definitely like on a, on a weekend after church. So everybody goes to church, then they go to the pub, and then they, you know, get together and have some food, have some beers and chat and have a good time and have a sing. And, um, you know, then they go home and, and live their lives. And then a lot of those people might even be working together. Like if you think of an industrialized sort of town, um, maybe like Burnley up in the north where 
there was a lot of factories and stuff. Those people, those working class people would go and they'd all work together in a team. So they'd see each other all the time. They come from the same sort of neighborhoods, work in the same sort of place, go to the same church and go to the same pubs. And, you know, maybe they see each other uh, at football or whatever, that sort of thing. That, that community spirit is probably it's kind of hard to come by unless you, you're a member of a club or something. Like, um, I don't know, maybe you go to an art school or, you know, you know, in your, in your spare time. Um, I, I used to like to do that. But then it's still not as, as knitted together um, because everybody is rushing around everywhere in their cars and, you know, be, you know, chasing after money or fame or whatever it is that, that they're doing. <laughs> Every, everything's so fast as well. I think that's, that's probably changed the, the pace of life. People don't have the chance to stop and chat with, with their friends maybe as much as they used to. Maybe I'm just being nostalgic. I don't know. Well, I think that you've got to a, a really key point here. You know, I think that that it's definitely important to bring that back. You know, and and also is how we can how we can bring the communities together. And you're right. I I also recognise. You know, we are we seem to live in a really fast paced society. You know, everybody, as you say, you know, this is something I've been reflecting on this year. You know what what does success mean you know yeah. how do you define success you know i think this is something that i've been thinking that the society tend to define success as you know money you know fame whose car is bigger you know yeah mm. all these sort of materialistic things and i, I realized that those things are damaging you know they are damaging to the society they are damaging to relationship you know because at the end of the day it is going back to when we talk about competition yeah you know but that doesn't bring out the best of people you know mm. because you can have as much money as you want but at the same time you know you can't you can't have good friendship you know you can't keep your health you know and and how many examples we look around you know people who own seem to own everything but they don't have the health to enjoy you know the fortune they have yeah you know, so although yes we do need a minimum you know i'm not saying we, we don't forget about money or forget about yeah, yeah, anything yeah else but what is enough you know what does it mean by enough and what what are the things we can pursue you know as human being i think i often think about you know what is the value of being a human being you know what why are we here you know and we mm. are still here you know how, thankfully you know yeah <laughs> so that, that that is um that is a the big question isn't it why are we here and um i think for me that was something that would play on my mind and, and trouble me and worry me before i had kids um and then the answer became really really apparent um and you know to to find meaning in your life um you know because we need to have a purpose and some sort of meaning um i think it goes back to what you said it's about um you know serving other people um and who do we serve more than anyone else it's our children isn't it we care for them we love them we want them to grow we we look after them um and you know having children brought, brought my life like huge amount of meaning like if i never you know if i never got promoted again or you know anything like that i think I, i'd be happy you know i'd be fine um, you know, just plodding along as I am now, because um, I don't derive um, happiness from the paycheck or from the title or from the accolades or letters after the name. Not anymore. Like I did before. Um, but now I, you know, I get most of my joy or almost all of it from from my kids, from my wife, from, you know, hanging out with each other. And in the job it's um you know i get all of my joy from talking with the with the students and, and with my colleagues and that's it and i think just i think relationships and interacting with people um i think that's where that that's where i find um happiness every single day um and you know i, I recommend that to to everybody find something that that makes um, that gives your life meaning and if that is your career then that's cool like and you know if that's gathering money and resources that's fine um but serving other people that's i think that's where it's at and um 
you know, nothing gives your life meaning like having kids. Yeah, I think I totally agree because that go went back to you asked me that question about challenge, you know, and I find as I explain, you know, when going through a tough time, yeah. but actually my love for my child had, you know, is huge, you know, because yeah, yeah. I want to be with him, you know, I want to be the happy self, I want to be the happy mother, you know, and and it kind of the potential, the amazing potential you can bring to yourself yeah people forget about that you know it's so easy to carry on feeling like a victim you know i think yeah. that is something i've been processing so easy to see yourself whether or not it's in the family at work or in the society you know it's so easy to to see yourself as a victim and feel powerless but for me you know it's about how to transform you know our thinking to not be a victim anymore you have to turn it around and i i can't deny that sometimes going through the pain funny enough it actually brings up more meaning to your life because you, you kind of reflect on it you know you, you think through it and on the other hand is how to empower yourself and how do you empower other people and i think for me you know i often say we have to start from ourselves you know we start from ourselves no matter how hard it is you know, I, I, I can't say that, you know, looking back, you know, everything was all, you know, smooth, you know, everything was so easy. No, never actually, you know, we all have ups and downs, but it's how do we turn those painful moments, you know, the, the difficult times, how do we learn from those experiences and what do they mean and how can we bring that out to our future as well? And, and you are right, it's because my boy seemed to give me a new leaf of life. You know, I look at him yeah. thinking, well, actually, I actually learned a lot from him, you know, out yeah. of his curiosity, his questions, you know, he questioned everything. Sometimes I feel like, oh my goodness, I need to go and find, find out about it. You know, he asked they, so many questions I don't know the answers for. <laughs> they, also have, they also have this way of, um, without even knowing that they're doing it, um, they they have this way of making you a better person. Like, you know, choices that perhaps you would have made before you had a kid, you you think more carefully about and you think, you know, is that going to benefit the whole family overall? Um, probably not. Okay, so we're not going to do that. And, you know, they they make me a better person. They make me a better man, like every single day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hope that that that, that happens to, to everybody else who has kids. Um, you know, everybody, I think, loves their children, but not everybody, um, not everybody grows um, when they have kids, and it's a shame. Not everybody takes that opportunity to invest their time into um, into their children and into their family, and you know, that's it's that, that's a tough thing to get over. Um, you know, when you have a rough background and and you've got you you're unable to change and you're unable to grow i feel bad for those people i feel mm. i feel sorry for them um hopefully they they find a way um mm. when it's not too late because that's yeah. you know you don't want to live your your life uh, full of regret of what mm. could have been um so yeah tricky yeah i think that that's why it goes back to sometimes um I've, i also feel that we all have a have a role to play you know when when you talk to you know total strangers sometimes you know i think we can't change the world you know mm. i can't change the world overnight but what we can do is starting from ourselves just kind of really listen to what other people want to say you know i think this is something that um this year you know i come across a, a book by nancy klein the promise that changes everything and she's talking about um thinking environment you know basically you know we do our thinking and when we listen to other people, you know, without making judgment, you know, it's really hard. You know, mm. I, I realized that actually all my life being a teacher and the job I'm doing, it's so easy to kind of very quickly kind of without listening properly. Yeah. You already make some assumption about the person. And what I'm so trying very hard this year and hopefully in the many, many other years is to to really work on this you know because actually even those people we probably hate you know because <laughs> strong words like yeah really dislike okay really can't get on with 
they, they get on your nerves. <laughs> yes, but they still have their thinking, you know. Yeah. And I think, funny enough, some people will say you can, you know, you can, you can disagree, you know, you can agree to disagree and you can still have friends. And I think it's really hard to do, you know, particularly nowadays, you know, people hold different opinions, you know, and, and again, you know, we, we tend to, we are human beings who like to get on with people we like, you know. Yeah, yeah. But... I also believe to, to really take ourselves to a different level is also to listen to different opinions, which is not always easy. I can't say I can do it all the yeah. time. You know? It's a very interesting concept, but I think for me, you know, that there's meaning to it because without understanding where they are coming from. Yeah. And I, also, yeah. I was going to say that I think um, that is a concept that has become come lost through the internet and the internet generation where you have the introduction of cancel culture or you know people shutting each other down or insulting each other becoming quite angry if you hold a different political view or you know something like that um whereas you know that that then leads to um echo chambers and you know reinforcement of different messages um and different world views and then when those two tribes or whatever meet in real life that's when the violence happens. Like I'm thinking particularly of uh, the American political system right now where they're very polarized, um, either by design or by accidental, um, you know, the, the way the algorithms worked, um, it's pulled people apart instead of bringing them together. And I, and I think, um, yeah, having the time and the opportunity to have discourse with people who you don't agree with or come from a different background or have a different political view, at least um, if you have the right environment to talk with people who have different opinions you at least you can understand things from their perspective a bit instead of um, taking that person and canceling them and shouting at them and putting them in a in a box somewhere and saying you know out of sight out of mind mm -hmm. that that doesn't help anybody progress um it just skews everything either to the left or to the right yeah totally and i think that's a big issue actually about, you know next generations actually looking at my boy as well this is something why you know having my boy almost changed me in many aspects you know I'm thinking about how he's going to grow up you know all this information he's going to have mm -hmm. and then again there's so much as you say you know the fake news you know how do you make judgment you know how do you decide are they true or are they fake mm -hmm. you know and actually ultimately you know we all leaving the well now there's just so much information you know and we have to come back to ourselves you know to to have that clear mind you know that kind of very clear mind to be critical you know and and I think rather than just following you know whoever says it whoever leads it yeah. you know wh where's the thinking so yeah, yeah that, that's something that um, I had a, a conversation about that with a student this morning and and they said hmm do you think the uh, the moon landings are real um, you know, or were they faked? And I said, well, you know, that's the thing nowadays, isn't it? You've got all of this information and um, you've got to decide what's real and what's not. And it's, um, I think that's the, that's the trickiest part, synthesizing that information. So like, who do we look to when, um, you know, we've got something like that, maybe um, a mentor or something. So leading on to, to the next question, um, <laughs> what's the best advice that a mentor has ever given you? um you know about the industry that you're in well um i i always mention her because she was my mentor when i was training a trainee teacher you know a student teacher um actually she was my primary school teacher as well she was all the reason why i became a teacher you know because she was just so passionate about her job and she was so caring you know even before we now having all this talk about inclusivity you know about equality she was already doing that you know she was really caring about every single child in in the classroom and if you remember i said i was so quiet i was that little quiet person in the corner in the classroom probably people would forget you know yeah. when i was young but she noticed that you know and she would make the best out of what i would do you know i would be helping out because i was quite happy to help you know, other people in the quiet, you know, I wasn't the kind of very loud, shouty one. So she noticed that. And when I became a trainee teacher, she told me one thing. She said, 
it's better make slow progress than no progress at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, and particularly I was, I wouldn't see myself as particularly, you know, like clever, you know, or, you know, some kids who are sort of gifted or, you know, very fast and they are very talented. I was just average really, you know, and actually in some ways, you know, I was quite a slow learner, you know, I, everything took longer for me, you know, I had to learn, you know, I love to observe a long time and I had to do it, I had to practice it, you know, I don't know if you like the um, Julie Donaldson's um, book, Zog, um, I don't know if your children no, I have, are into it. Oh, I it's fabulous. I haven't read it. I'll, I'll oh, get it. Yeah, well, it's just amazing because, sorry, you know, Zog um, is a, he, he's a dragon but he, he's always the last one to learn the skill okay you know but he was determined he was practicing yeah, yeah. you know he was practicing practicing and then he would get that eventually so I feel a lot to resonate with and my boy was so into Zog at the moment so we watch about I don't know hundreds of times <laughs> yeah. and and then I remember my mentor and she just said to me you know it's not again it's not about competition you know we all have different skill set we have different qualities you know the main thing is carry on going you know don't stop yeah you know keep walking you know okay you can't run that's fine you know some people are super runner i'm not you know but i can walk you know i make little progress you know and very often the story about the hair and the you know the, t- the tortoise you know so that is always a story about me you know I'm the tortoise you know I may, I may be a bit slow you know and then <laughs> perhaps not as fast as everybody else but, but you never give you up know? like that's that's the difference I'll get it. yeah so um you know I, I got the same message but from a different place so um th- there's a, a sort of a, a speech that has gone viral and it's you know it's very it's a very powerful speech by um Sylvester Stallone in the movie Rocky Balboa, yeah. where he's having um, a, an interaction with his son. And his son is feeling downbeat and he's feeling like he can't step out of the shadow of, um, of his father, who's, you know, four or five time world champion boxer. You know, a, any friend or anybody who wants anything to do with him is only interested because of the fame of his father. Yeah. So, um, you know, he, he's in the street and he talks to him and he said, you know, life is not about um it's not about how, how hard you get hit or if you get knocked down it's about how hard you get hit and you keep moving forward you keep pushing forward and um you know it's about not giving up and he said you know if you want to be something go and be go and be that thing if you want to fight for something go and fight for it you know you don't blame me because you're failing you have to keep going you have to keep moving forward and it's um it's something that really sticks with me that it doesn't matter how many times i fail or get rejected from you know, I've been, I've been rejected like five times, like for, for PhDs and stuff like that. I get rejected a lot and, um, I, you know, I'm working on it. I'm getting better and, and I just, I keep going. Um, you know, I find something else to do, um, you know, and it's the same with anybody who's like looking for a job or didn't get the GCSEs that they wanted or didn't, you know, if things, whatever, whatever it was, whatever that plan was, if it didn't work out, don't just quit. Like, you know, you've got the rest of your life. You just get back up, keep going and try again. And and that's what happened for like um, Richard Branson. You know, it's not, you know, and, and many of these other people, it's not that like Virgin was the first company or the first business that that guy ran. And the same for Amazon, the same for Microsoft. Well, maybe Microsoft, that might have been his first business. But, um, you know, there are many, many, many failures on the road to success. And it's, you know, that people see this overnight success, like where you suddenly come into the public eye. But what they don't see is all of the failures and all of the knockbacks and everything that comes before it. And you've you just got to keep going. Um, you know, whatever it is, you just got to keep moving forward. Yeah, definitely. And as you say, you know, it's also learning from the experience, you know, and I think the experience is definitely make us more endurance. You know, I think people tend to use the word resilient, but I think yeah. I move away from that as well, because you don't naturally become resilient. And no. for some people, it's really hard. And but I think we just become more flexible, more endurant, you know, and, and it, it's the way we are thinking. And you're right, because without making mistakes, you know, how do you know this is the path you are taking? How do you know, you know, you are, you are kind of on the right track or how do you know this is what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy? You know, yeah. and I think 
again, you know, I, I can't say I'm always good at that. But I realized that, you know, in the past, you know, I was always very cautious, very careful, you know, and that's how I was brought up, you know, unless you, you, you are fully committed to it, you don't do it. But I realized actually, you know, I've been too cautious about many things, you know, mm. sometimes we should just have that kind of courage, really, in to say, I'm just going to give it a go, you know, and then see what happens, because you never know. And I think yeah. you're right, a lot of people who actually not thinking about whether or not this is going to be successful. What they do is I, I enjoy doing it. So I'm just going to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, yeah, that was another um, piece of advice or a quote that I, I read about Richard Branson. And he said, um, you know, anytime somebody offers you an opportunity, just take it and just say yes. Mm -hmm. And for me in 2016, that ended up with me um, leaving teaching for a short period mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, developing and, and managing um, and building a Star Trek exhibition yeah. in Blackpool which is something totally different yeah. and and also at the same time um, I ended up um, you know traveling to Malta and North Africa and because I just kept saying yes to things and it was I was kind of partially inspired by that that film Yes Man with Jim Carrey I just mm -hmm. thought anytime something's going to come up I'm just going to say yes and see what happens and before before I knew it you know I, my life was totally changed um, and you kind of you have to weigh up the risks obviously especially if you have a family but while you're young and you don't have any commitments if somebody said you know oh i'm gonna go to australia for a year do you, you want to come like just go for it you know just do something just get out there and yeah. um, you know take that risk and be brave yeah um, yeah so um education is um is tricky isn't it and um you know you're how would you how do you frame where you are in your career right now what you are you are you senior management are you or no I, well no i'm not well if you want to use the hierarchical title yeah 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 no i'm not a i'm not at management management level no but okay. in terms of my role you know i actually change my way of thinking you know i see yeah. myself a leader you know particularly because the job I'm doing, you know, being a teacher educator, also, you know, working with the whole faculty, you yeah. know, and I realized that um, to some extent, you know, I'm doing quite a lot of role in terms of leadership, you know, although yeah. maybe not in terms of organizational leadership at manage managerial role, but I see myself being a teacher, you know, being an educator, but also working with teachers. Yeah. You know, there are so many things that I really enjoy doing, for example, you know, working with teachers as a community, facilitating and so on. And this year, as you, you know, you know, I put on a pause on my work, you know, work, work, yeah. but I don't start working, actually. You know, I'm still doing a lot of other stuff because I want to invest time in also looking outwards, you know, yeah. so sort of external networks, you know, because again you know going back to teachers you know we actually need to find the right communities or we can build the right communities to nurture our lives you know our teaching lives because for me you know that goes back to you know particularly we talk a lot about sustain sustainability but we need to also think about sustainable practice for educators for teachers you know, because we talk about how often, you know, things change, you know, maybe the policy changes, the curriculum changes, you know, we have to adapt, you know, everything very, yeah. very fast. Often very quickly, yeah. Exactly. And that is quite stressful, you know, and for some teachers, it's, it's filled with anxiety, you know, because, mm. you know, you'd be told, you know, well, by the way, you know, we're, we're going to change the qualification, we're going to change this, change that. And in some ways, I find that these days, being a teacher, you, you really need to be so adaptable. You know, it's that kind of adaptability, which is quite amazing. So how, so, do, you, how do you build that adaptability into your practice? Like, what are, the, what are the most helpful resources that have helped you along the way? Well, I, I did mention about thinking, you know, without good thinking, you know, that is always a starting point, you know, and the thinking also help you to prioritize, you know, what, what will be the most important thing for you. But for me, the most important resources are not actually physical resources, it's actually people, 
Okay. So for example, you know, what you are doing here is you are actually starting your own little community here, you know, because you open this space up to invite different people, you know, which I'm so amazed by, you know, because all these different people and listen to your podcast as well. I thought, oh, that's yeah. really interesting. I never heard about these people. So again, it's going back to when we talk about inviting diversity of thought, you know, yeah. from different angles, because I don't know how you feel sometimes when you work in the same place, the same industry for too long, you become quite mm, insulate, yeah, you know, like yeah. a little bubble. And the last few years, perhaps because I'm doing my doctorate, you know, and, and also through doing my doctorate, I met many other people. It really opens up my mind, you know, it's really, really strange because the last 10 years of my teaching career, you know, I was quite content. I thought, yeah, you know, stay my, stay put in my little place, you yeah. know, I do what I'm told, you know, I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it coincides with being a parent, you know, you kind yeah. of start thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm in my 40s now, halfway through my life, if I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> What do I want to do for the rest of my life? You know, what is important? What, what is meaningful? What is truly meaningful to me, mm. but also maybe to the people around me? So I think this is when I, you know, it took me a while. You know, it's not easy because I'm very cautious as well, you know, because there are so many communities out there. You know, where do you start? So I need to kind of do some thinking to myself and really do my own work, you know, because... I felt I was emotionally drained as well. I feel tired, exhausted. We've, we've been through a hell of a lot. Like yeah. all of us, everybody yeah. has. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody in every school and college and university across the UK, maybe even across the world, yeah. we, we really were at the tipping edge of, of burnout, you know? And it's just because so much responsibility was put on our shoulders, yeah. um, you know, and then the added the added um, complexity involved in trying to keep everybody safe and keeping yeah. yourself safe and your family safe and, and managing the workload that you already had and you know the unpredictable nature of um, the outcome as well of you know um, the outcome for your students and for, for your class and, and your uh, attainment and achievement it was um, it's a lot to deal with Exactly. you are carrying like a rock you know every yeah. day you know and and I think that goes back to then I realized you know if you remember I said you know I have to look after myself so then I can do more work mm. you know so that's when I realized you know I you know I need to put a pause you know I need to pause there are things I think is important I have to look after my health but also look after my family's health because my husband is a social worker my goodness okay. <laughs> his work is <laughs> talking about the responsibilities you know and I think as a family you know we are both in public sector you yeah, know wow. there's he, so much pressure put on us so I realized I have to look after him too you know because yeah, yeah. got all these families he's looking after so so that's why going back to your question you know I the resources you know i find is the right people you need to find your people so i actually found you know quite a few really supported communities you know one is joy fe you know it's about joyful practice which i'm afraid you know in education not just fe really you know in education and we talk about the pressure we put on ourselves as teachers and educators you feel really tired exhausted you yeah. know and I often say, you know, if you are not a happy teacher, how do you expect a happy student? Yeah, you know? yeah. So how do we continue to nurture ourselves with joy, you know, with that kind of ongoing joyfulness, sustainability of carry on for the next 20 years, 30 years, because otherwise you know why people burn out. You know, they do it for a few years, they burn out, mm. and then they just stop. What a shame, because they are often very fantastic teachers, fantastic educators, and particularly in FE as well, you know, because the recruitment is an issue, retainment is an issue. So I think it's very important to really focus, you know, going back to the fundamental issue, you know, how do we look after our educators? How do we look after our teachers? 
so we can carry on our long lifelong career you know looking yeah. after the students you know bring the joy to to the workforce you know and how do we do that and i think i don't know the answers yet you know because i'm still working on that you know but but yeah, that community gives need, me a lot of joy i think we need um not only um not only recognition for the work that we do because that that's just one tiny aspect of that um but we need um an understanding from perhaps ministers, education ministers, people who make policies mm. and then management that, you know, th this is a hard role and, you know, we need proper breaks and proper facilities where you can, um, you know, be comfortable. And, and, you know, we, we spoke earlier about when you're always at the cold face, you, you know, you're energized and you're, you're in action and you're able to give it your all, but then we need those little, those little caves to, to go and retreat into um and i think i think that would help you know yeah. um not working through your lunch like prohibiting that mm. that would be that would be one one area where people could just get out go for a walk do something else just get out of the office get away from questions and decision making i think that would be that would be good yeah definitely i think that is also i realized that you know we we need to take the lead you know, and sometimes I feel in the past, maybe I will see myself a, a little bit passive, you know, also expecting the organization to do it, you mm. know, other people to do it. And I realized rather than expecting other people to do it, organization to do it, we can all start from, you know, doing something maybe small, even, you know, yeah. like with colleagues, you know, you, you, colleagues, we are a team, aren't we? You know, you notice, you know, when yeah. your colleagues are looting looking tired, looking, you know, exhausted, you know, and sometimes we forget, actually, we need to just show a little bit of care, you know, and have a chat, you know, have a coffee, you know, like you said, the lunchtime, you know, I was the same, you know, I would work through the lunchtime, so like, mm. you know, doing yeah, this, yeah, yeah. and then I realized I'm not doing any, any, any benefits to myself, yeah, you yeah. know, in a long run, or, perhaps my colleagues you know sometimes you just need a chat you know get out get some fresh air you know do the walking meeting for example which I never really considered doing and I realized actually walking meeting is fantastic you know you don't you don't sit you know sit in the classroom you know yeah and, yeah we, we sit enough <laughs> don't we that that's yeah. one of my big problems is um you know sitting sitting down too much I've started um, just trying to stand everywhere I go working on uh, on the laptop on the windowsill or yeah. um you know just uh, standing in front of the class and just just not sitting down as much you know I do too much of it and I'm, get, I'm getting a sore bum <laughs> <laughs> yeah so do something different you know I think I realized that you know when when I was sitting here moaning about it you know getting frustrated by it all yeah um and I realized I have to change, you, you know, can, yeah, and people you, you often can, sort of like to just moaning about it, you know, yeah, not yeah. doing anything about it. So yeah. I think well, that's I think that's where most people fall down, because actually being the change that you want in the world requires effort. And most people are intrinsically lazy. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, in some I think respects, like if it's kind of out of your remit, you just you ah, uh, someone else will take care of it, <laughs> and then it never gets done. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I I, I won't deny that because I I have the same thinking too. Mm -hmm. But I think I realized that you know when you actually think in a long term, you know when you actually look your life as a whole, you realize that we do need to make those small changes, and we yeah. can. Although it's hard work, but also recently I realized that, you know, the, the change don't happen overnight. It's actually, mm. you need to turn it into a habit first. Yeah. You know, yeah. like everything. And same with my PhD, you know, I realized people say, well, how did you manage? Because you work full time, you're a mom, you know, you got yeah. a young child and you, you're doing your PhD. And I, I can't say there are times I'm just in tears really you yeah, know I'm like oh, yeah. oh you know what what do I do to my, what am I doing to myself but I also realized that you know you can do it but it also requires determination but also I know it is a cliche it's a time management you know when when I realized that I need time to do the writing I have to stick to you know my pattern yeah, you know, stick, routine. stick to a schedule having a routine yeah, yeah I have to important. do that 
yeah and mm. you know and you can but it also requires a little bit of discipline too you know it's, so um so what is your phd topic my PhD topic, you know, the title is quite long, you know, yeah. but in short, it's about working and learning together. Okay. So the th whole thesis is really like a piece of narrative and my personal experiences of starting, building and nurturing a community of learning. Yeah. Because it's a very small group of people, you know, I have very in-depth sort of interaction, connection with those teachers I'm working with. And I wanted to write the whole thesis, like to record a journey of it, you know, from the beginning, from my perspective, you know, being um, I described as an insider, you know, because yeah. I'm working within the organization to do the work. Mm. But I want to portray it. It's not that easy, you know, when people are looking out for hours, they think, oh, yeah, you know, you're doing a great job. Everything's smooth. Everything looks kind of easy. Yeah. But yeah. I had my own struggle. So my thesis is very much coming from engaging those teachers, give hopefully, you know, I do them justice to bring their voice to the fore, you know, so individually they're all different and they have all experienced teachers you know, going through different stages of, you know, their teaching career and so on. And me as well, coming in from an outsider, you know, because I never worked with them. So coming from an outsider, like a total stranger, thrown into, you know, this area where I have to work with all the teachers. And I, I, I was really scared, to be honest. I was like, <gasps> I had no knowledge of what they teach, you know, it's not my yeah, area, yeah, yeah. but that journey has been so transformative, you know, because I went through ups and downs. I recorded my experience, you know, I, I kept my journals and then obviously, you know, through working very closely with them, you know, I, I did different workshops and the model I use is called joint practice development. You know, it is a theory, but I reconceptualize it, you know, because that's my story with, with those teachers, you know? Yeah. So I presented their stories, I presented my stories and somehow these stories become one, you know, it becomes our story. So the whole thesis is one long story for the, the last four years, you know, my working life, my learning with them and hopefully it's their learning with me as well. And it just, amazing you know and I never thought I could do a piece of work like that you know yeah. and and I never considered I would do a PhD either you know when I first and started how long have you been working on it for now about four years now and I'm I'm nearly finished my work now you know I'm sort of doing the final kind of proofreading you know checking you know unfortunately you know everything has an end to it yeah when, <laughs> when is your um when is your submission date well, end of this January, actually, this, this okay. month. Yeah. And then, but, and then are you, are you coming back to us? Well, I will, you know, um, I'm still, uh, have to wait for a Viva. So it's like an oral examination. Okay. But yeah. once I submit it, I have to wait for the examiners to, you know, to read the work and then I'll have a proper examination and then they may ask me to do some amendments and so on. So, you know, it's, it's always ongoing, it never mm. stops. And hopefully I'll get all done and fingers crossed pass. Um, and then I want to kind of focus a few work, you know, like more writing, you know, and maybe engage with, you know, like you and some of the communities, you know, there's some work I like to do and my expectation is to come back to work in the summer. Okay. And yeah. so, um, you know, you've been on this incredible journey over the past four years and even longer, like you, you probably count the past 20 years of, you know, starting um, your roots in primary school right up until now. Um, you know, you, you must have picked up loads of different tips for success along the way. So have you got any that you could give to uh, the listeners? Well, um, I've been thinking about it really, you know, it's not an easy one, I would say. I think I want to keep it short. I want to keep it simple. Yeah. You know, all I would say is keep learning, never stop learning, you know, and don't limit yourself. I think a lot of people tend to find excuses, you know, mm. they will say, oh no, I can't do it. 
oh no I'm too tired I'm too old I'm too what too 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 you know yeah. have to cross that out <laughs> you yeah, know and, yeah and, like oh I'm, I'm no good at math so I'm, i you know i can't do it but uh you you know practice you can practice you can do it yeah, yeah. and the thing everything. is people tend to think you have to be like the expert you know you got to be a mathematician for example yeah. when you talk about math no you know it's about recognizing where you are you know everything is situational and obviously assessing your situation. And then if you have this idea, you know, you want to do something, I, I think go for it. But I often say, keep learning, you know, and particularly if you are in education. So that's, um, that's a really awesome tip for success. Just keep moving forward, keep learning, keep going. And um, would you say, is that um, a good piece of advice or have you got, you know, one piece of advice that, that you would give to the listeners? Well, I think going back to being a human, you know, we are all mm. human. Yeah, what know, does we, it mean to you? What is being human? Yeah, mean to you? I think we have to go back to recognizing that uh, being a human being's compassion is very important, you know, and go back to when we talk about success, you know, success sometimes doesn't come from just one person, you know, actually success requires a whole lot of people around you you know a whole mm -hmm. lot of resources around you to make you into a successful person and i think people tend to forget you know don't forget you know those people around you you know the people you are working day in day out it is important to show a bit of compassion you know and actually it's almost like human beings need to relearn about compassion not just about human beings only it's about the world you know about the environment about the animals you know the wider picture you know to continue us as being human beings you know and that goes back to you know what what is the value of we human on this planet you know mm. here right here right now you know so uh, yeah i guess like outside of the outside of the family family home and the responsibilities of work we're, you know, t together, all of us as a society should be looking out for one another and not only looking out for each other as humans, but mm -hmm. trying to build a better world for all creatures as well. Not to sound too like hippy dippy about it. You know, I'm not about to go and protest, uh, you know, an energy plant or anything like that or eat a vegan burger. But I'm just saying, you know, like the, there are different levels of kindnesses that you know we can all do like maybe you could start a commu community garden or something that would you know make your area better and then bring uh, more wildlife into your neighborhood uh, you know maybe there's an opportunity for you to do that that sort of thing it might you know it could be very small um but yeah being a human is uh it's complicated and i i think even after all these thousands of years we're still not we still haven't figured it out i don't know <laughs> Yeah, but then I guess that is why we need to keep talking about it. You know, yeah. don't stop talking about it. You know, and and again, you know, I I often think that well, I'm not going to win a Nobel Prize. You know, that is not. You know, I think that's that's got to be quite unique. But individually, you know, when we go back to what individually, what can we bring? You know, to to the world. You know, we as mm -hmm. you say, we can do small things, even like very tiny gesture, like. What about our neighbors? You know, do we yeah. know our neighbors? You know, sometimes we don't. You know, mm. it's really strange. You know, we're living together, you know, next to each other for like 20 years. You know, do you know their names? You know, yeah. <laughs> you go around yeah. and say hello. You know, I think this is when again going back to bring the community spirits back, and particularly with COVID, you know, there's such emergent of people we recognize, you know, we need to have that support you know we yeah need to we need each, each other. other yeah we, we need, need each, each other, other. Yeah, yeah definitely so yeah <laughs> beautiful yeah i've you know i think um we we did a good stretch that's that's awesome and that that's a beautiful note to um to end the end the podcast on and uh you know getting back to your your father and getting back to the beatles you know maybe maybe john Leg uh john lennon said it you know said it best all you need is love right Definitely, yeah, I love that. You know, I'm gonna play that song, you know, after yeah. our interview now. <laughs> yeah, where's the love? You know, bring the love back, you yeah. know, whatever you do, bring the love back. Yeah. And um, you see, you know, you are starting something here, Paul, as well. You know, I always want to say, you know, I'm so 
feel privileged to be invited really you know before oh, no, you invited I, I, me I was like well what can I say <laughs> yeah, oh, well, I, no you've done you've done amazing I you know I think this is a this is a really powerful podcast with a lot of um a lot of good messages um so yeah um you know thanks so much for your time like it, I'm the one who's actually honored to have you on you know I really look up to you at work um you know I know we work in completely different departments you know we we've only known each other for a couple of years um you know in passing but you know I I really look up to you you you're a big influence on me um you know at work so um yeah just keep on doing what you're doing and um you know you are making a difference with with what you what you do and who you are and you know how you present yourself um everywhere you go so yeah just keep it up you know you you make me happy you know it was great to see you the other day in, in passing with uh with Richard there you know I couldn't talk I couldn't stop and talk but you know it, it was cool to see you so yeah. yeah I hope to um to see you again um you know January or in the summer after your PhD is sorted out and um, mm-hmm. good luck with that I know you're going to smash it you're going to do great thank you and we all do you see you know we all make a change so you know you, d- you don't have to wait until summer you know I, I keep saying we need to perhaps there's something you know collaboration or something we need to do you know because again this is something I always feel that rather than keep looking outwards as well although I have but my intention is to bring them back in you know what what can we do also individually and also collaboratively within the coming you know the organization you know what can we do Mm. you know I think we we need to bounce some ideas and I think is desperately needed (laughs) you know and I think we we need something you know rather than as I always say rather than waiting for the hierarchy to take that decision in a way we are all leaders you know we can start something you know from from, from the grassroots upwards definitely yeah that's that is a nice way to say so you know I love that you know we need something from the bottom you know from from the grassroots you know it's just you can't wait you know we we have to do something together so yeah i'll probably contact you anyway you know probably, yeah for you know, sure we can have a monthly catch up and you know or even walking meeting if you have a gap you know yeah that. yeah walking meeting for sure yeah, i'd love yeah. to do that yeah that'd be awesome yeah. I, I, I need the exercise <laughs> Russia is great <laughs> yeah 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 and you know we're, we're not you know we're very close to the walks aren't we so you know we can uh, we can take that in it's, yeah. it's beautiful there I love that definitely yeah yeah so so <laughs> awesome that's it thank you so much Joyce Chen um so anybody you know who, who's watching um make sure you like and subscribe and you know stay tuned because you never know there might be an episode two um Joyce might come back I don't know what do you think you might come back did you enjoy yeah, it probably yeah we should yeah. have some topics and so on you know I, I, there could be a variety of different topics yeah. you know so and you carry on doing your great job because I really enjoy your podcast with thank all you. the different people I never ever imagine you know meeting or listening. yeah I know I'm very very lucky to um you know to have such you know wonderful guests who, who give up their time to come on and talk about their uh, their lives and and yeah. you know the things that they love in their careers and stuff it's um I'm, I'm learning a lot from it it's uh it's awesome and it's I wish I'd done it earlier um you know and it's it brings me a lot of joy in life so I'm going to keep on doing it yeah brilliant oh I forgot to mention another community you know I have to do that it's the learning okay. hub, the oh learning yeah, hub. yeah 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 <laughs> I yeah, feel like should... you know I can't miss them out because Jane Birdwick is amazing she's an amazing person you know get in touch with her as well you know get yeah we should, we should say um you know thank you so much to all of our colleagues um as well you're doing a great job just keep on going um and also a big shout out to uh, my BTEC level two students they keep telling me to say hello all right guys how are you doing guys and girls um yeah this is for you so um, yeah hope you enjoyed it all right yeah. okay thanks Take care. see yeah, you later yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>